said something in a video the other day that I loved and you do have this tendency to bring up just the, this these unconventional insights you know that are just a step to the right or left of the way we usually see things which I love and this one was um how you framed financial freedom mm. and I'd like you to um to share mm. that again because that was wonderful yeah yeah exactly this is good because so many of my clients they want to make money right they want to be financially free they want to travel the world they want to be out and financial freedom for them is having so much money that they just never have to think about bills or where it's coming from so it might be like a million in the bank it could be 500 grand a year coming in through what they're creating and it's you know and growing over years you know so creating true financial freedom the thing is it isn't true financial freedom that is just having more money the mindset of needing it hadn't wouldn't have changed and so true financial freedom, which is what I created for myself earlier this year, is not needing it, is knowing that if I'm on the fucking streets, I am, life is good and life is happy. Um, and then any money that comes from that is a gift on top of that, it's like a bonus, you know? So when I couldn't, so in January, for instance, when I had that conversation with my mortgage company saying, you've got a week to pay the mortgage. If you can't pay it, we're gonna take you to court for repossession. You know, it's my worst fear. It's my family home. You know, this is where I grew up. This is my dad and mum gave to me. I took it on when my dad got ill when I was like 20, 21 uh, to actually help the family. To then come to the point of actually losing the house is a big deal. You know, it's my worst financial fear um, of leaving my job. And but in that moment of knowing that, you know, I, I didn't know how I was going to make any money in a week. I didn't. You know, I was still coaching and trying to, but nothing was working. Um, and then to actually know that it's going to happen. I was like, this is going to happen. So that means I have to go to court. I'm going to have to have these conversations with them. I'm going to be fucking honest about what's happened. Um, but the reality is that we could go for repossession. In, the, in that, it's like something just shifted in me. You know, that, that feeling here, that tension just burns, just disappeared. And, mm. and I knew I'd be okay. I knew my mum would be okay. I knew my family would be okay. And it's so funny because I it just by I didn't know what would happen. But seriously, once I burned that out, every time then when I was coaching people and proposing, I had no attachment to them ever becoming a client or paying me money. Suddenly I actually started getting some fucking money, <laughs> which is a shock. Um, and yeah, it's interesting. So because I didn't need it, I, that energy probably came across. And so mm. I actually, it actually started coming into my world. So I paid that mortgage. And then gradually over time since then, it's, you know, I've had, I've had months where I've made many thousands and months where I've made fuck all. And life is great either way because I'm coaching fucking amazing people. I am, I've got amazing friends and beautiful family. So life is beautiful. So yeah, true financial freedom is not needing it, is not being frightened of being without. Mm -hmm. That's true financial freedom. And that is when there's no limits to what can be created. You know, in a sense, um, if you're not coming from that place of, you know, psychological freedom, mm. then it's kind of a house of cards that you build up with the more money, the more money, the more money, the more money. It's mm. actually, you know, you're not you're not free from it. You've just created a scenario with which it's a, it looks kind of good. <laughs> it looks kind of good here. If that changes, obviously, you know, that can be panic stations for a lot of people, which is what mm. we've seen over the years since the financial crash. You know, I knew a... Um, you know, a very successful couple um, of brilliant entrepreneurs and they were extraordinarily successful. The, the, the figures that were coming in with their business were just off the scale, um, but they, they had a house of cards, you know, in many respects. And as soon as things got challenging, they just didn't have what they needed, the resources within themselves to meet it. And they went bankrupt. And these guys were taking, to, to let me tell you, they were taking like footballers' weekly salaries, you know, with their business. It was just, it was something else. So, um, yeah, that's... Um, that's a nice insight. The what you said about um, you know nearly losing your house, the mortgage thing. It reminded me of um, the conversation we had just the last time you were here with us, um, when I I shared what I nearly did to mess that all up for you. <laughs> yes. Oh yeah, that was interesting. Yeah. I um, obviously I had no idea that this was in your mind. Yeah, because you knew I was struggling financially, didn't you? 
Mm. Um, and you knew that I was, I was, you know, I was struggling to pay the mortgage. And yeah, that, so yeah, what, what, what tell them? So what, what, what were you it's thinking a, of doing? It's a, it's a really interesting phenomenon, this, because an, an entrepreneur's mind state is different than the normal mind state. And I liken it to an athletics, an athlete's mind state. There's, there's a lot of similarities there in regards to what failure is and how they approach challenges and things like that. Now, um, I love talking with my wife over this stuff because at some, uh, in some places she finds it really odd mentality, but then I kind of give the, the context what underpins why we communicate the way we do, why we treat each other the way we do. And it's actually on the outset, it looks like callousness. It looks like less caring, but it's actually love is deep respect and appreciation and value. Um, and a, an example of this was, um, uh, you know, to, to actually a good example of this is um, I shared with Donna because she was confused by this email I got from um, a friend who's another entrepreneur. He was meant to send me along some uh, some stock, um, some uh, health food products, and uh, basically communication was poor. They didn't arrive in time. It kind of meant that we were kind of challenged about receiving this stuff and getting it to where it's meant to go, and it kind of put us out. And um, Donna kind of noticed. He said in his emails because she kind of saw the correspondence I was going through. She said. Um, it's weird, like he hasn't apologized like once. And I and I turned to him and I said, oh no, what he's doing is far, far better because all of the language in the emails was about constructively solving the problem. Mm. Um, and everything he was doing was to constructively solve the problem. He didn't need to apologize, mm. you know. And mm. our normal social um, you know, niceties and a normal use of language would necessitate um, oh, I'm so sorry, and I'm this, and come from a place of remorse. Whereas in our world, what we want to hear is mm -hmm. how are we going to constructively move forward from now. That that is, you know, whatever energy is within the sorry, whatever you know, those kind of things, it's channeled into that. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a different, it's also a different way of communicating, a different way of thinking, and different kinds of use of language as well. Mm -hmm. And and so the other example, which is between you and I, and you didn't know about until last week was that when um, David shared with me how challenging uh, it was and how close he was not being able to pay his mortgage. So, you know, wanting to support David and believing in him and what he has to offer in his work, my first impulse was to give him the money. And I began to write the message of, to, to, to you know, let him know, hey man, I'm going to cover this for you for this month. And then I stopped because I knew I was taking away from him the very experience that he not only needed but was inviting was creating was asking for mm. and you know on the outset it's look hey you know you should give him that money he's your friend and he might lose his house and that looks like the compassionate thing to do mm. and the, the, the loving thing to do but knowing what david actually wants out of life and knowing what he wants to create that was actually kind of a self-involved thing to do if i'd have done it Mm. It would have come from a place of wanting, you know, my own feeling of wanting to help would have overridden what actually, David, what you wanted, which was you wanted to create this off your own back and do this thing and make it happen. Mm. And when I, you know, when I shared that to you, <laughs> the beautiful thing was you said, thank you so much for doing that for me, <laughs> which seems like an odd conversation. But, you know, when you understand where we're coming from, um, you know, that that was a, not giving you that money was a, a, a deep you know it's a deep act of love mm. yeah it's interesting because you know it would have been a beautiful gift you know and i would have been grateful and i would have probably i don't know actually if i would have accepted or not i i honestly don't know uh, it depends on my my mood at that moment probably um but if i had have accepted it sure i would have paid that mortgage but then what what, what comes next you know um and so yeah i do i wouldn't have had the gift of of fa having to face it in that exact moment and then like you say just work create my way out of it and interestingly um because i had i had a coach throughout this time right the, the incredible john morgan and i was paying him you know i could have paid my mortgage but i chose to pay him instead why did <laughs> i do that because my mortgage was keeping me stuck in this moment right paying the mortgage great but nothing changes paying my coach though helps me dig deeper to create what i created so without that, I wouldn't be where I am now, you know, without, without, and it's interesting because we, we've had, we have an interesting discussion, haven't we, recently about the need for struggle. And you were saying about how struggles a douchebag and uh, one of our many <laughs> philosophical disagreements. Um, at, 
And whereas you're like, no, no, but it needs to be challenged, right? Challenge not to struggle. And although that, that is a great semantic difference, right? And I live through that now. I, you know, I don't see anything as struggle anymore because I live through that. However, I had to struggle because I was in a I was in a victim mindset at the time. And without experiencing that struggle, I wouldn't have been able to create the internal shifts that enable me to see every fucking thing in life as a challenge now, as an opportunity. Mm. So for me, the struggle was essential to that thing, you know. I, I love the diamond metaphor, um, which is about how a diamond's formed. You know, over a third of the life of the planet Earth, the, the, the rocks are pre under immense pressure, immense heat below the Earth's surface. And it's because of that immense pressure and immense heat that the rock was squeezed into that beautiful diamond that now, you know, costs, you know, thousands of pounds. Um, and that's what I believe is true for me. And if you look at your life and, the, you know, your, your, your health issues you've had throughout your life, it's the same thing, you know. The struggle is how you've created the effortless, evil Buddha life that you are living now. <laughs> um, in case you don't know, I call Richard the evil, the evil Buddha because he is, as you, we have a very different style. Right? I'm all about, all about loving fear, about going for it, about, you know, high energy and just going nuts. And which is very chilled. Life is effortless, peaceful and full of love and simplicity, um, which, I, which is fantastic. Fucking hell, I'm just looking at the to the high tens. Wow, thank you. <laughs> I'm I'm winning. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, I've noticed that. <laughs> thank you. Um but yeah, but um and so it, we, Richie has this very relaxed, effortless way of living. But I believe, and what I've seen from your story is it's having those early struggles in your life that has created that. And I see it again and again with the people I coach, with my friends who are doing incredible things. It's those moments of like immense struggle when you feel like a fucking victim and you feel like, it, you know, that it's, you just can't cope. <clears throat> That's how you forge this powerful person that you become, that is able to become an entrepreneur, able to make money, create a wonderful, beautiful life. That's what I believe and what I've experienced. Now, what do you say to that, evil Buddha? <laughs> hmm, give me a moment. <laughs> um... <laughs> okay. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we have these conversations, myself and David, we have these um, little s semantical tugs of wars and philosophy. I call him my, I've just, I'm starting to refer to you as my philosophical nemesis slash soulmate, which yeah, sums it up pretty well. I agree with that, yeah. What happens is, is from the different approaches, the vantage points me and David have through conversation, through the magnificent tool of conversation and listening, um, we end up exploring the commonality in what it is we're getting at. And, um, you know, I can see David's perspective over my experience of, through, of debilitating chronic ill health throughout my life and the mentality, the mental approach I have to life now and similar challenges that I'm, you know, I'm going through presently, actually. Um, it, what I, the thing is my focus where I'm looking at the footnotes are, okay, what is it that's, that's actually led to the transformation? Um, what is it have I learned that's meant that I get to experience what other people may experience as struggle as challenge? And the big difference, as you know, we talked about earlier when we were communicating about this, um, is that the idea of a challenge being an objective thing, an objective thing that's happening, and struggle being the way that we we encounter it, the way that we interpret it in our inner world. Mm -hmm. So the difference between struggle are those two things a struggle and challenge um I, I i gave the example before of a climber is a climber a brilliant climber when they're climbing a wall are they struggling or are they just climbing you know mm. as they're climbing their mind and their body is maneuvering with the challenges as they arise they adapt and they learn from those challenges but are they struggling and if you were to ask an athlete you know what do you do with a challenge would they um well you know would they reply i struggle with it you know, and of course they wouldn't. They'd reply, I overcome it. Um, I traverse it. I, you know, I transcend it. All those things. And this, likewise, a, a prolific and effective entrepreneur, someone that's skilled in life, um, would have the same kind of answers. I, that said, the context David has given is absolutely right. Um, and I'm just going to carry on talking until my high tens get past yours. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what David's saying is absolutely right. Um, there would have been times when I struggled 
with my with my illnesses with my pain as a child very very young there were times i struggled the times that i overcame the challenges were when i surrendered from that that struggle in my own inner world uh, because if i'd have kept on doing that i wouldn't have survived i really wouldn't have i wouldn't have had the resources i needed to overcome those challenges to stay switched on to educate myself to 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 further ease my suffering and transform my health in later life so the difference um is between the struggle and the challenges really uh, the way we engage with it and once you realize that it is just challenge and the struggle is internally created it liberates you to be able to traverse challenges in this effortless way you know in this way when we take i'm looking at stairs right now so here's the analogy that's going to come when we walk up these steps and these stairs you know there's as i as i put my foot on the stairs i'm applying resistance and the step is meeting my resistance with resistance. And to gain momentum, I have to traverse that resistance. I have to apply energy and I have to face that resistance on the steps. Now, I just keep walking to get up those steps. I may come to a point when I stop. And I could easily convince myself if I was to go within my, my inner anxieties that, um, you know, this step looks a bit higher than the, the other ones. Um, I don't really like the look of this step. Um, I don't think I'm up to this step. I may even kick the step, hurt my foot, blame the step. And all of these things might go on where all I need to do is take the step and carry on taking the steps. You know, I don't need to, put, to, to, to tie myself in knots with that kind of inner gymnastics. Um, it, does that mean that's how I always feel? No, but it's how I mostly feel and that works kind of well. In my personal life as david knows my wife struggled with postnatal anxiety and depression for a period of about five years that was an incredibly challenging time um and was i always happy around that time no and i'm not talking about always being happy um i'm just talking about being switched on to my what it is what what mental energy i'm putting on top of this situation that's what i'm talking about because if, if i'd have if i'd have had a mental um if I'd cultivated the idea of struggle over those five years, I wouldn't have made it, wouldn't have made it, wouldn't have been able to help her, wouldn't have got past it. Um, and whenever I caught myself in a dynamic of inner struggle, I just had to let go of that shit. So. Mm. Yeah, an interesting point you raise is about surrender, which another word for that could be acceptance. And for me, what I, what I found is that there's no way around the fact that when you experience things for the first time, chat, they are going to feel like struggles. You know, it's you, can, you can't, in my experience, make the leap from everything's great in life. This shit comes up. Suddenly, it's it's the challenge only. Mm. I mean, I be you know, I just don't. It just I've, I don't see that. If you look at entrepreneurs around the world, you look at some of the best top guys. If you look at their stories. Generally, there's been a death in the family. They've had to look after themselves from a young age. It's, there's something that's happened young, which has forged this 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 desire mm -hmm. and this ability to create beyond their circumstances. You know, time and time again, they've had like you know come from council estates and um, you know upbringings that actually some of them are quite horrendous upbringings they've come from, but they've they've pushed beyond all that. You know, I mean, Duncan Bannatyne's famous for his sister died and then you know it's, it's from that place that he started to create the ice cream business which then obviously launched his career as like this amazing entrepreneur now and in fact those guys on the dragons then whatever you think of them personally each one of them says in interviews and things that they in fact they have most of them lost it all at some point and got it back again mm, lost all yeah. their money lost all of their trappings of success and got it back how have they done that they've done that because they've struggled they've then learned from that struggle and then like you say that struggle it's no longer becomes a struggle anymore it just becomes part of a life in fact it's what forges them forges their, their the business to be strong successful and resilient and we're also talking resilience here aren't we um in fact in, in business a lot like these days they talk about mental toughness now i used to poo poo that idea i was like you don't need to be mentally tough because <laughs> you kind of don't and yet you do you know it's, a, it's an interesting thing because when i coach someone like you know i could be coaching them and it, and it just takes one little insight like you said one thing of just looking from this little distance and everything changes for them right but there is a thing about continuously attacking something or going for something 
going through the fire and forging yourself to to be almost like fire retardant you know mm. um so that nothing can ever touch you again even death even illness even you know anything that happens in life just becomes part of the, the incredible life that we're living um which enables us to create anything you know deep loving connections um successful businesses money you know it all comes from that place um so but the, there is a there is a moment where it has to go like you said from the perception of it as being a struggle to this is actually now surrendering like when i surrendered to the fact that i could lose my house right i sit in that moment it was full acceptance of this is probably going to happen and i'm just going to have to deal with it and in that moment i surrendered to the fact that i would lose it i was i would you know it could be a tough few you know very very tough few months for me and my family and then i was okay and it's from that place of surrender and acceptance that I was able to create some fucking amazing things, you know, which has obviously led, led us to this conversation right here. It's, um, and this is where we're coming to, and this is where we always end up coming to this place. It's what serves you, who you are, when you are, where you are then. You know, it's basically, ha it's all about transmuting and channeling. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a few things you, you said, the one, just coming back to the idea of struggle one, one more mm -hmm. time. If your perception of struggle or challenge serves you in that when a struggle comes up, and this is the interesting thing, Dave, and I'm going to, I'm going to you know, ask you about this. If, mm. if you're going through this a lot and you get excited by the idea of struggle, you may have missed mm. the fact that when the struggle comes up, you're not struggling anymore. You're excited. Yes. You, know, you may still call it struggle. You may still see it in those words. But the, what the experience is coming is excitement. And that might come earlier and earlier and earlier until it comes instantly. And that's what's mm. happening. The thing I think we need to be aware of, and I think people need to be aware of, is the story of struggle and creating that story of struggle in a way that invites unnecessary struggling mm. and repeats the cycle of co-creating in the world around you the same stories in your life to overcome. You don't need to be doing that mm. because, you know, we want to honor these, these, this glorious impulse of evolution and expansion, which means that we don't want to keep living the same thing over and over again. We want to move forward um, into new challenges. And in those new challenges, like you say, you may be in a world of struggle might spike up again. And you could take yourself forward from then as well, hopefully. And the other thing I want to um, just look at is the idea of resilience, which you brought up. Yeah. And these are the other two ways that we'd look at things. You, you may, you, you'd probably look at things with um, a place of resilience, and I'd look at them from this place of freedom. Um, and yet, um, yeah. what I think generally happens with us, David, I don't know if you agree or not, but we have an 80 20 thing going on. Um, and we talk about our 80 a lot, but when we get together, we end up having to talk about each other's 20. Mm. <laughs> so, I mean, so my, you know, I look at, I, I choose, I look at resilience, I think, okay, resilience is good. Resilience is great, obviously. But resilience necessitates something to be resilient against. It necessitates something to be resisted because of the derivative of the word being resistant. It necessitates that. Is that a story we're creating and inviting? Mm. In which case are we robbing ourselves of freedom? Now, freedom is a different thing from resilience. Freedom mm. allows us, it allows us to move beyond the challenges we've already faced. That's that's where the freedom comes in. And so this mm. is the thing I'd like to ensure mm. there's an awareness of that in the reverence of struggle, that we're not actually unnecessarily repeating the cycles of struggle in our lives mm. um, and to actually allow the possibility of freedom. And this come up for me just the other week talking about, you know, with our friend Michael Hilton about addiction. There's a big belief system in the world of coming over addictions and AA and all that stuff, which is very effective and it works um, for many, many people. But there's this idea of, um, you know, once you're an addict, you're always an addict. One day at a time, these kind of things. Mm, yeah. And, th and those Perfect. words and those belief systems mm. don't leave the room for the possibility of freedom. Mm. Um, now, I am free from some extraordinary addictions. I dabbled mm. in a lot of them. And I went full throttle. I mean, I, 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 I was stealing cider from the shops when I was 10 years old to get drunk. That's how ferocious I, mm. I, I enjoyed um, just messing around with how I felt. And cocaine, gambling, um, a lot of other things. And I'm free of them completely, utterly free. I wouldn't be free of those if I still championed these, these ideas, these, these beliefs that um, 
uh you know i once an addict was an addict one day at a time mm. i don't even i don't even perceive myself of having been an addict i just mm. made choices at the time and i kept making them over and over again and then i decided to make different choices mm. so that's the thing i just want to invite into the conversation although i think what you say is beautiful as ever and i i'm absolutely with you and it's a part of my experience i also want to make sure that we have enough awareness over it that we're not revering those things so much that we're kind of holding ourselves back from being even more incredible, creating even more uh, from a place of freedom. Um, so, mm. no, I agree with you. Um, for me, it, struggle is part of the path. It's not the path. It's just an essential. It's like the, the baby steps. You know, it's the baby falling on its bar, on its belly as it tries to stand up for me. Um, mm. But once you can stand, then it, you didn't, there's no more struggle. You know, then it's right. about and it becomes like, how do I climb over this obstacle? You know, that, that's the kind of way I see it. Now, there is an interesting thing that's happened. Um, there's because there, freedom is, in fact, interestingly, I named last year, you know, from the 1st of November last year to the 1st of November this year, my year of freedom. Not the year of struggle. No, it was the year of freedom. <laughs> the year before was the year of struggle. <laughs> I didn't name it that, but it fucking was. Um, um, the year of freedom. But the, but obviously there was struggle within that. Create. It was And for me, it was freedom from a relationship which was bad for both of us it were and you know all the energies around that the job that i didn't want that to you know for a company that didn't give a fuck about me or my family or anything about the people that worked for them um it was freedom financially which i created through facing my worst fears of losing everything um freedom in myself like you say it's a freedom to realize that you can just choose mm. you know it's about you know have i ex am i exercising choice here or am I a victim of circumstance? Now, there's a funny thing that's happened because I've, I mean, by the way, I'm a person who for most of my life, 34 years really was stuck. You know, I was, even though I was on a personal development journey for like, for like a few years, I was still stuck. You know, I was still in the same place of employment for 17 years. Can you imagine driving the same journey, the same building with the same boss for 17 years? That was what I did. Um, and to think that I could ever get through that, I was not a person who, who sought out challenge or struggle or whatever you may want to call it. You know, I didn't seek out these things. I, in fact, kept myself as stuck as I possibly could in a little bubble is what I, is the way I lived for most of it. Now, obviously, the past two years has been where it's all, well, I've just cranked it up to a massive degree. It was actually six months after my dad died. You know, um, I, I'd, I'd love to have come to this before then, but I didn't. So six months after it was like, right, I want to create my way out now. What do I do? And that's when I began this path. And that involved a lot of challenge, a lot of putting myself out there, a lot of failing, you know, hugely failing again and again and again and making loads and loads of mistakes. And interestingly, it's when this resilience that, I, that I'm saying to you, it's like this, it, not struggle, but there has to be some, for me, the resistance is the fun. I fucking love it. You know, <laughs> when things are tough, I love it. It's exciting yeah. to me. You know, it's, it's like, it's like I can't wait for it. Now, this is a problem for me. I'm not totally free here because earlier in the year, I decided in January, we were actually on New Year's Eve with a friend of mine. We're like, what can we do? You know, what, what do we want to create this year? And I was like, uh, I said, we, I, I come up with astronauts. I want to coach an astronaut, right? I think yeah. that'd be fucking awesome. You know, so, you know, someone who's going out and just testing the limits of human potential. I fucking love that. So then I started to, I mean, it was just a crazy idea at the time. A couple of days later, though, it wouldn't, it wouldn't, it wouldn't go away from me, right? It was nagging. And so I started to think, what can I actually do to bring him into my world? And I'm on LinkedIn. I started just seeing, am I connected to any? Oh, actually, I am by like two or three people. So I started to reach out. I created loads of connections with astronauts. Um, and I began having conversations with astronauts. You know, people have been doing, people wow. have been up there, people who are, um, on their way there, you know, loads of different people, people at NASA, at SpaceX, you know, I was, I was creating a world within like a couple of weeks. Then I got bored. It was like, it was, it was just too easy. I actually, I'm like, don't get me wrong, I wasn't coaching any astronauts already, but I'm, how do you, how, how would I coach an astronaut? Well, I create a world filled with them. They know what I do. I, you know, I just be who I am and I know it would naturally happen because that's just what, you know, that's the way it works. And because it happened so fast, I lost interest completely. I stopped talking to them and I, I stopped bothering. Um, I just and I did. I haven't bothered since because of that, because it was too easy. And even recently, right, I decided that I wanted to create. I wanted to do a bungee jump because I'd never done one. I bottled it when I was like 18 years old. And I'm like, I'd love. Do you know what? I, I spoke to a friend. She's like, Why the fuck can't we just do it then? I'm like, Do you know what? Okay, I will. 
but how but for me i can't just do a bungee jump i'm like how can i make it more better so i'm like okay let's let's make let's make it what metaphor could i create around this and i'm like for me i'm at a stage in my life again where i'm making a leap i'm making the change in my life so i'm like great let's create a day called taking the leap you know where it involves deep coaching and at the end of that um we i you know during the middle of the day we take a leap off a bungee and at the end then we catch strategy for the future and then i can bring some people in it so i, I so i imagined it i thought it i thought this would be great i'd love to leave a small group of people to, to to come on this with me um so then i, I put at 10 o'clock at night i created it i wrote it put it out in facebook within a few days i had like people wanting to be part of it right it was all there ready to go happened so fast i just took took my foot off the gas again i'm like oh shit it's too, it just happened too quick so I still, weeks later, haven't actually arranged this fucking thing because it was too easy. Um, you know, that's the problem for me with effortless, with effortlessness. I don't enjoy it. Uh -huh. You know, um, I enjoy it. Now, I, wouldn't, I don't see it as struggle, but I, there has to be some, like, path that I'm, like, I have to, I have to, you know, it's like there has to be a fucking mountain <coughs> for me to climb, you mm -hmm. know? Um, and so, yeah, for me, struggle, definitely not. But there has to be challenge for it to be mm -hmm. exciting. It's one of, one of my core values, I guess, um, now is it has to be challenging. It has to be something, you know, that because also it's like if it's effortless, for me, what's the point? You know? Um, so yeah, that's where I am with that. Mm. I've got, well, what, mm. the um so you know, you have to be inspired. You have to be inspired. Yeah. And it's that which inspires you. But again, I just give the the um, you know, it might be a semantical thing, but I give the example of the uh, the wall climber again. You know, he's challenged. That is exciting. That is, I mean, you've you've been wall climbing recently, right? I used to do it. I loved it, and it's so much fun. Um, and it's being fully and utterly engaged with an ongoing and unfolding challenge. That's what it is. I mean, when you're experiencing things getting too easy. And you're not having to, again, if your mind and body isn't having to maneuver and adapt mm. and traverse, this is what we are. If a human animal is nothing else, we are a genius of ad adaptation. And that's yeah. how we've evolved to the point we are. You know, we are the, we are the singularly most adaptable, um, you know, uh, mammal. We're extraordinary in that mm. way. So this is woven into us, really, to have that. This is why routine experiences are a recipe for depression and human um you know illness we we know we need it's when we go into fresh environments and we travel and we do these things that we we feel most inspired and most connected with really who we are authentically and we feel well and we feel healthy and all of those things that's expressing ourselves in in the way we should be we should be doing that soon as something looks like it's a routine soon as something looks like yeah. it's a little bit not it's not that well we're not having to engage with it at moment to moment we're just going through emotion um you know that's what's what's going to unfold yeah i, I you know definitely i I'm, I'm with you completely the um yeah cool go on go on no no i've got something else to come back to but you go on if you want to no i was just going to say because the what you know 17 years the same place with employment i did change roles which is why i default really um but essentially it was groundhog day and i lived in groundhog day and that was it wasn't great i didn't feel great doing it but it was what i did and now it's the opposite. You know, the entrepreneurial mindset is just like, what's next? What can I create from this place? How can I make this better? And that's like, a, that's like deeply ingrained now, you know? It's like I do talks, as you know, obviously, um, <laughs> since I've done them for you, right? Um, and I, I, I could not do the same talk twice. It would bore the fuck out of me. Now, I have hmm. done a talk. I, I do do the same title talks, you know, like I did one called um, How to Create Deep Connections and Find Your People. Did it first with Rosie, my my partner in crime, um, who's on this call somewhere, Rosie Allen, who's awesome. Um, then I did it on my own at Interesting Talks, and then I did it again at Interesting Talks just a couple, a couple of weeks ago. But it's brand new, you know, different exercises, and also I'm just creating it in the, on the spot. And as you know, in Bristol Veg Fest, you know, when for the Life Well Hub, you know, I, I mean, you and I both did three talks that weekend, didn't we? Yeah. Um, I took a leaf out of your book because again, you would just show up and speak, right? And that was the first weekend where every single time I just showed up and spoke. I didn't know what I was going to speak about. I had a title and a rough description, but I made it up on the spot. And so, and so for me, I, yeah, I, difference is it really. Difference and creation. That's like the entrepreneurial, <clears throat> you know, juice for me. Um, so that's definitely like one of the biggest shifts from when I used to work, you know, at the same place of employment to becoming an entrepreneur. And I, I can love it.
Yeah, right on, man. We, you know, this comes up a lot with other, you know, other speakers, public speakers, and we speak about this a lot. Some some speakers do they put together their polished presentations, and that's a part of <clears throat> something that they're brilliant at. You know, I I've never been one to be able to do that. I remember when I first when my presentation evolved to a point where suddenly, oh, I'm just going to give this perfect presentation now that I gave last time. And the first time I did that, I actually gave the same presentation as I gave the, the time before. It, I wasn't there. I just wasn't there in the same way. And it didn't carry the same thing for me at all. And consequently, I didn't engage with people the same way either. And when you have, you know, this is something you can fall into. And again, this is, you know, this is something that you apply to life in general and entrepreneurism. When you have a plan and it's kind of rigid, um, it closes yourself off from opportunities. You know, it's like we were talking about the other day, the mentality of being an expert prevents you from being able to learn something new mm -hmm. because you can't, you're coming to situations like I'm the expert. Well, how are you going to learn from the people around you if you think you're the expert? You know, you can't do that. So you have to just if you catch yourself doing that. And I, I you know, I shared with you when I kind of caught myself doing that with something and I and I oh no, I nearly thought I was an expert then for a moment. How am I going to learn, you know, from myself, from my experience, from other people? It won't happen. You're robbing yourself of growth. And um you know, likewise, if you've got this plan, right, okay, I'm going to do this and you do it in this way. But something happens in your day which creates a flow of thought and creativity. And, and you could bring that to that talk. You could bring that to that. But you've got a plan. So you go, oh, you know, best not go with that because I don't know what's going to happen. That's a risk. Mm -hmm. I'll stick with the plan. And you're robbing yourself of magic because the magic really comes in a room full of people. Something's come to you that day and it's inspired you and you turn up and you just start coming from that space of whatever it is that's inspired you that day, or whatever insight you had. And then the magic happens. Why? Because you are just at your peak. You're at your peak of creativity in that moment. And people are connecting with that and they meet you there and that inspires them. And it's beautiful. And it's a wonderful thing to do. The, um, you know, there's one, one big element. I mean, you, you, um, you know, we've covered uh, the challenge element and, and struggle uh, and, and these kind of things. But there's one big element, I think, if we're going to cover, honour this, this subject of entrepreneurism and success, mm -hmm. And that's our relationship with failure. Um, and um, we both, this, this is funny, Donna, Donna will tell you this, but when I was watching your blab with Michael a couple of weeks after I, I, I had the, the time with Michael, he asked me the question, um, what's your biggest failure? Mm. And I answered him. And then a couple of weeks later, he asked you that question. And I sat here and Donna was just to the side of me. And um, you started to go, okay, what's my biggest failure? And I turned to Donna and I go, He's actually thinking about it. <laughs> he's at, right now. He's thinking there's such a thing as failure right in this moment. And trying then, to, and then trying you, to. you try to, and then you caught yourself. And I said, "That's my boy." <laughs> <laughs> no, I tell you, I tell you what it was actually. He asked me the question, "What's your biggest failure?" And because I don't live in a world where there is, that exists <clears> for me anymore, <throat> it was like I was, to be honest, it was, it was a question through me because I'm like, "How do I now? How do I step yeah. back into the world where that exists?" <clears throat> I had to do that. I had to pretend I wasn't me anymore. Go back <laughs> to who I used to. That's what I was doing. That's what I was actually going through my mind. So, and so that's when that's you know that's why I was struggling with that question so much. So what what's you know what's the real answer to that question? What what's what what is failure to you? Failure to me. I mean, it's just experience. Hmm. It's just that's it. It's experience, right? If something doesn't work. Guess what? What do I learn? This, in fact, when you were speaking earlier, I was thinking one of the biggest shifts to me going from a worker drone to entrepreneur is a learning mindset. It is my ability to take a, le a lesson from every experience of my life going back to the, if you know, from, from my earliest memories. And that's one of the things I've done as a coach. You know, part of my journey is to go back and learn, extract the lessons from my life. So for me, you know, if, like he said about the failure thing, like what we did, you know, one of these questions was about, you know, could you go back in time and change something? What would you go back in time and change? And it was very difficult for me to even answer that question because everything in my life, that even the shit stuff, the years of social anxiety when I was ostracized, of having no friends, of feeling isolated and alone, the times when I was addicted to drugs and I was, I actually thought I was going to kill myself just from smoking myself to death because I didn't have the fucking ability to just stop smoking, you know. Um, it, all of that stuff, you know. Um, if I had to change any of that, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't have created what I have in this moment. So failure to me is just experience. It's just life. It's just a wonder. It's just, I'll tell you what, that didn't work. Now, what can I take from that and apply here? 
that's it, you know. Um, and and now, if I haven't failed this week, I haven't tried hard enough. Nice. That's how I look at it now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What What about you? Well, there's um, you know, there's actually a Chinese proverb which summarizes beautifully, which is, if um, if something has been learned, there has been no mistake. Mm. And you know, Michael asked me the same question about failure, and it was difficult as well. It's, you get caught in your mind because mm. no, no, there is no failure. Again, coming back to an athlete's perspective, you think of what failure means to someone at bench presses who bodybuilds and trains their body. Failure is a place you get to because of the effort and energy yeah. you've put in. Failure is welcome. Failure is something you want to reach because it means you've put everything in and you will build and grow based on reaching failure, which means not being able to lift one more thing. You know, that's what it means in, in those terms. Um, and likewise, when you, an entrepreneurial mindset, failure is not the same thing as it would be. It is not this something that would even make you contemplate giving up. Nothing like that happens when the idea of something's not gone to plan or some a challenge looks like it's, it's, it's insurmountable. Um, you don't get the pang of, ah, oh no, I should give up, and the, all the fears and all that kind of stuff. If you're going to be an entrepreneur, if you're going to if you're going to create a sex, successful life for yourself, if you're going to be excellent and magnificent at this or that, you, your relationship with failure has to become something completely different, and that's to see it as a growing experience, um, as an actual uh, inevitable innate part of success, mm. not actually yeah. just not the opposite of success, a yeah. part of success. And, you know, I gave the example to Michael the other week and I'll give it again is the Wellbeing Now seminar is the perfect example of a success that could have looked like a failure. Now, the first seminar we put on, we had to cancel because of all sorts of problems. Was that a failure? Well, no, because it was a path to the next event that I put on. And the next event that I put on was beautiful and stunning. Did we make any money? No, I lost thousands. Was it a failure? Mm. Absolutely not, because it was, it was beautiful and wonderful. And guess what? There's another event coming, and it's going to be 10 times bigger and better than the mm. one we did before. You know, it's just that's how it works. And you have to liberate yourself from this illusion that failure is something to be avoided. The mistakes mm. are something to be, uh, you know, miss. You know, you don't want to miss. You want to make as many as possible because that means you're learning, mm. you're growing, you're moving forward towards that place of excellence that you want to occupy or you want to achieve that goal, whatever it is, don't Mm. think there's not going to be things that look like it's going to go wrong along the way. It's always going to happen. But again, we have this idea between struggle and challenge and how we facing it and feeling it. Um, How we, how, what's our emotional experience of the idea of something going wrong? Is it, um, are we coming from a place of acceptance or excitement? Those are two Mm. very healthy ways to to approach it. We're coming from a place of, you know, uh, fear, anxiety, um, depression and the negative self-talk um, and certainly 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 liberate ourselves from the idea of what will other people think if I fail forget that forever you know that's one <laughs> thing we don't need on any level but you, mm-hmm. liberating yourself from the the um, the the inner anxieties of what other people feel about and think about you know um, what you're doing it's just that's that's a beautiful thing that we we have to do um, as we're as we're going forward so yeah that's what i have to share yeah there's a a, a small piece around that as well because it's not like i change i don't use the word failure Mm. um anymore because that's that's the thing when i did nlp training many years ago which i've now left that kind of way methodology behind but when i used to do nlp there's a famous phrase which is there's no such thing as failure only feedback Mm. and as an nlp master practitioner i was walking around all proud of myself and when I'd see someone, you know, like I'd be training like some other NLPers, right? The, the, the practitioners, I'd be, you know, I'd be coaching them. And I'd be like, there's no failure, there's only feedback, you know, all cocky like. <laughs> but guess what happened when I, guess what happened when I, when I failed? It didn't feel like feedback to me. It felt like fucking failure. It felt horrible, right? So it's just like, there's a thing that happens when you try and reframe it, you know? It's actually essential part. It's not just that, you know, it's essential for what you want to create, failure, you know? It's... And don't try and change it or, you know, semantically alter it. Just live it. Live through mm-hmm. that thing. It's like, it's like you said. I used to think that failure was like when I fail, it's like I've taken a step back. And, that, you know, my success is much further away. It's how I used to believe. Mm-hmm. But then, I, then, of course, through, through experience, through coaching and all sorts of things, I realized that there's success, right? Or what my imagination of what success looks like is over there. Here's failure. Here's fucking it. The quicker I can fail, the faster more I can fail, the quicker I get to where I choose to be. Right on. 
Mm, and it's a fucking beautiful place. And and as you said, you're, we are both now in a place where there's there's nothing that will stop us, right? There's nothing that would ever make us mm. go, I'm going to give up now. Mm. It's just, okay, well, maybe I'll sidestep this or I'll step over that or mm. there's that wall there. Let me, let me just climb over it quickly um, so I can keep going. Um, mm. And that, that works, like you said, in, in every part of our life, whether it be a financial success, whether it just be creating a beautiful, connect, connected life with people we love. Mm. Right on, man. Right on. Well... Should we have a look at us um, over there on this right hand side to see what if we've had mm. any questions or feedback we need to address before mm. we, we sign off tonight? Um, cool. Okay. So right, I'm going all the way. Wow, there's a lot. Okay. What if we scroll up, do we? Yeah, okay. we scroll up. Okay, well. Um, okay, hey guys. Hey. Hey, Noah. Uh, we have a question here. Okay. Oh, this is great. Questions are marked with a Q. I know here in the US, that's a huge gender thing in our culture. Do you find the I'm sorry is being an expected gender issue there? Um, I, I, I don't, I'm going to feel first, I don't see it as a gender issue, but I see it as a social issue. I see, um, mm. you know, this, but uh, this, um, the part of our relationship dynamics, our dysfunctional relationship dynamics as a culture to mm. always put this burden of expectation on other people. Um, mm. You know, as, as it's expected because think about it as children what, what we if you did something that was perceived to be wrong you were told forcibly to say sorry and if you didn't mm -hmm. do that there'd be big consequences you know you'd, um that's one thing i've tried to avoid as a father is I, i've never actually ever once instructed my daughter to say sorry or or please and thank you what i've done is i've apologized to her if i get things wrong um if i have fallen short in my own in my own you know perception i will let her know i'm like you know what honey sorry i didn't listen as good as i could then and by leading that showing that example guess what she says sorry please and thank you more than other kids right uh, but we most likely were forced into a situation of sorry 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 so it's something we have an expectation of to help us feel at ease so if something's got us feeling at odds if someone's done something like earlier the example I, I gave someone has made a mistake it's their fault they're to blame so you feel this about it and uncomfortable so they need to say sorry you know, so you can, that feeling can go away, you know, and that's the kind of way we, we've been living things. Um, that's the issue as I see it myself. I don't see it as um, uh, a, a gender issue. Um, I'm not sure where you're coming no, from either. there exactly, but it's certainly a social issue we can just escape from. And again, when you're escaping from these things, the social norms, do it unapologetically. You just do it com with absolute embodied confidence with the whole thing. Stop living down to the expectations of social norms um, because you know, you know like David it's a perfect example if someone comes and attacks him with small talk he will tell them <laughs> 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 he will tell them some of us would just kind of on and go for the motions a little bit David won't mm. they were like I'm not actually interested in this and he'll move on with his <laughs> life and um, you know there's something there's certainly something to be said from that I do it with love though because exactly. actually, because realistically, someone's doing that, they don't want to, they don't really want to be talking about that either. They're doing it because they think they should or they're trying to, you know, it's, it's actually, again, sometimes saying something directly that actually may hurt them in this moment mm -hmm. is the best thing that can happen to that person. Because maybe the next time they go up to someone, instead of just saying some bullshit that they don't really care about, they'll say something that actually matters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so yeah sorry yeah definitely that's one word I've, I've, I'm burning out more I still say it sometimes sometimes too much you know because it's still in, it's still ingrained a little bit sometimes I'll say it and then I'm like well it's only good if I'm doing something about it right <laughs> otherwise it's just a, it's just a word um, and the energy around that word can be quite negative um, so yeah I, I like the Spanish the Spanish um, for sorry is lo siento but the literal translation is I feel it and I really like that. I feel it. It's, it's basically saying I care. Yeah, I like that. And I like I like mm. imparting that I care. I like imparting that if someone has, because I'm not responsible for other people's feelings, you know, I'm not, um, because I can't, with my Jedi powers, make them feel things. Mm. I am responsible for how I treat people. And if, I, if I've done something that I don't think, I then afterwards think, you know what, I could have done that, but I could have communicated that in a better way. I will say that, that I will apologize. I say, and the words I often use is that wasn't my intention. Um, and that's the best way I can communicate where you know, that I am coming from a place where, um, you know, what I'm, I'm acknowledging that I could have done better there. 
uh, mm. because that wasn't my intention to to have you you know feel that way after whatever i've said and done um we um right now i'm getting a lot of high tens from from my wife and uh hey donna we, we come into oh, Emily's been waving at us apparently. Hi, Emily. Yeah, I, I noticed that I gave her a wave earlier. Oh. She actually came in the door and waved at me earlier as well, and I oh. um, gave her a little kiss. Um, mm. uh, but uh, you know, when me and Donna got together, she would say sorry every other sentence, and I'd stop her. I'd say, "What are you saying sorry for?" She said, "I don't know." She just felt like because of things that had gone on for her and her upbringing and all those kind of things sorry was her place she was coming from like she just had to be sorry for being alive you know um and we we over a period of time um you know dropped dropped all of that um because it, it can be it can be a place of just you know, feeling anxiously bad and not wanting the other people to be judging you and all those kind of things um so it's indicative it's representative of a lack of self-esteem um a lot of the time not all the time but a lot of the time mm -hmm. So let's, what else have we got here? Have you noticed? Have you... I, see, I see David's has said something here. He says, it may not be your intention, but your mere presence impacts the way people feel. And I agree with you, that's true, but it's not our responsibility how people feel in our presence. We just get to, to be who we, who, we, you know, who we are. And as long as you don't come, you know, don't mean to intend to hurt anyone, mm -hmm. then you know, just be you know just be true to yourself is the best thing you can ever do for anyone who's in your presence you give them the gift then of being themselves um which is one of the great which is probably what i do with most of my clients actually it's removing the layers of bullshit they've got on themselves over the years so they can actually just be who they truly are doing what they truly want and there's a way of seeing this um this idea of you know i actually see it. i don't see it as a positive thing um feeling very bad about things when you've upset people and the reason being is i don't mm. believe i have that power over somebody else i have more i have more mm. i have more respect for their sovereignty as a human being than to think that i mm. can somehow dominate their feeling experience i can't um i can't do that and i don't that isn't from a place of um anything other than i truly respect them as an empowered human being um, and I feel that within myself too. And I don't want to go in assuming because I feel this way and I don't feel like I need other people to say sorry in order to relieve feelings within me or anything like that. I do. And the people in my life, I do want people that take responsibility for who they are and what they do and how they impact people. I, I do want that. But at the same time, um, I think there's something, there's another level here of, of, um, of acknowledging and respecting people, which means you don't kind of see them as, as vulner vulnerable to you in, in that way um and to see them as weak um and i don't believe in walking on eggshells either i don't even though a lot of my views are very liberal and the very um uh, on the left wing of things when it comes to my political kind of compass um you know i don't believe in walking on eggshells i believe in talking about things and having faith that people people's limbs won't fall off just because you've said an idea they don't like. Um, you know, I, I believe that we have more going on that. And if that is happening for someone, it's no bad thing that you're triggering it off because it needs to come, it needs to be in their experience for them to, to see it and go beyond it because mm. there's so much more within us mm. than go, walking around being beholden to what other people say and what other people think. You know, that's that's not a place that I see us as a human species occupying in a healthy way i think we need to go beyond it and uh, yeah but, but that's a really interesting point because actually the times when i'm when things do piss me off when i am the most frustrated or i look at someone and they wind me up and i'm like it's like i'm offended there's something in me that's creating that it's like what is it about them about what they've said that is true for me here that i need to deal with you know and so that's how I go through it. If, if something, you know, don't get me wrong, people wind me up sometimes. <laughs> and, but, it, 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 what, you know, that's always because of me. It's never because of them, mm -hmm. ever. You know, it's, you can, nobody else has any power over me and I don't have any power over anyone else. You know, we influence the people in our lives and we can choose to do so positively by living the best life we can. But um, any time they're upset, I'm upset, that's all down to the uh, to us, isn't it? To who's creating the upset inside of themselves. And, you know, it's the difference again. It's the difference between blame and responsibility. I don't want to be blame centric. Mm -hmm. Blame uh, and responsibility can, again, in our language, be used um, in place of each other, but they're two distinct things. 
um, and responsibility. Mm. I love the word responsibility. I remember when I, when I first realized what the word meant. Mm. Responsibility is the ability to respond. Oh my yeah. goodness, what an empowering concept, what an empowering word. Because when you live with responsibility and you take responsibility and you have that sovereignty in your own life, you have the ability to respond. You have the ability to change circumstances, to influence them, to change yourself. Without responsibility, without taking responsibility, you don't have the ability to respond. And blame is more of a, a place where you lack the ability to, to create positive change around you. It becomes a very, um, you know, uh, it's a very destructive, stagnant place, you know, and you're forever looking to, for someone else to take it. Responsibility, I want it. Mm. Whereas blame, blame mm. centricity, you want someone else to have it. Okay, and that's, that's mm. the difference between self-empowerment and self-actualization and living in a victim mindset. Actually, just uh, there's an interesting point about where I used to work. They were very much a blame culture. It was like, who's done it wrong? Who can be punished? Who can, who's done this, mm -hmm. you know? And so what happened? Created a culture of, it wasn't me, it yeah. was them. Or, you know, and there's a, there was like people like, no one wants to touch this yeah. thing, right? When actually, the thing is, it doesn't have to be your fault that it happened. But when you step up and go, I'm going to deal with this, let me handle this. You know, that is like a position of power to come. That's what you, and you want that. You want that. Yes. You want that. Definitely. You know, and again, it's counter yeah. You want that. That gives you all the power to, to create all the change you want in yourself mm. and around yourself. Right yes. on. Be a true creator in life in every moment. Yeah. Right. Responsibility is at the core of it. Mm. Right on, brother. Well. Good man. Well, I think we're at the we're at the hour mark, aren't we? We're cool. Mm. Hey. Man, thank you. You now have the keys mm. once a month hey. to, to the Life World Lab. You, you have no idea what you've just done, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll see what I do next month with it. Yeah, and um, you know, thanks mm. to everyone that's been here and stayed with us and engaged with us mm. over the course of this. Um, it's such a joy. And you know, we're going to be doing this, one of us is going to be doing this every week, every Sunday, 7 30 p.m. GMT. Um, we're going to be having these shows. Myself and David will be hosting some of them um, and some other brilliant people are going to be hosting the others and we're going to be having guests on sometimes. Tell us where you want us to go. You know, make comments. Yeah. Let us know, not just throughout the course of this, but afterwards on the Life World Wellbeing Facebook page. We'll be posting the events. Let us know then this, you know, whatever you liked, whatever you want to hear more of, wherever you want to go, we will take it. So this can be something that really serves you guys that, that are joining us for it. Um, and we really want this to be something that does is it, it, I can't tell you how much being able to do this on this platform um, and people just being able to tune in, at, you know, at their will and their leisure and join us and us be able to, to share and be helpful in this way. It really it's got us all pretty excited. So um, um, it's going to be a lot of fun and uh, we'd love you to keep joining us and uh, being here with us as we evolve it. Mm. Definitely. Yeah. Thank you very much. Right on. Oh, 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 oh,